lack of world building. Part of what made G4 so fascinating were all the cool, bizarre, and fascinating places that were scattered around Equestria. Every location felt unique, such as rural Ponyville, Cityscape Manhattan, the treacherous lava-filled Dragonlands, and so on. And then in the movie, we have a grand total of three locations, which are... Certainly locations. Granted, they didn't have much time in the movie to establish a lot of locations, and the film's job as the pilot is more to introduce us to these locations rather than explore them in depth. That's the show's job. So, how did Make Your Mark expand on the world building? Well, the movie gave us Bridalwood, which consists of trees, crystals, and a playground. Make Your Mark gave us trees, crystals, a playground, and... Uh... Dirt? Grass? What else? What else? Uh, oh, the, the Together Tree. I guess that's something. The same can be said about Maritime Bay and Zephyr Heights. What little the movie established, the show did not expand upon. But what about new locations? Well, let's take a look. We have the Dragonlands, which consists of plants. We have Opaline's Castle, the Breezy's World, which is a shopping mall. And we have Grandma Figgies. That's it. That's all the world building we get in terms of new locations. Does the Dragonstone Mountain count? Still part of the Dragonlands, so no. But yeah, the most that Maritime Bay ever did was reuse Cantor Logic as this weird creative studio, but that never went anywhere. Bridalwood's Night Market was mostly just a big plot device to give Sunny the deus ex machina of the locket. Zephyr Heights? Um, it got a new tree? Besides our core location, Starlight Ridge is pretty much the only interesting looking place in all of G5. Both the village and the ponies that lived there had a unique look. I love the atmosphere of the place with all the star flares and the aurora borealis. It was great. Unfortunately, we've only been there once and we'll never go back there again. The Isle of Scaly was also very disappointing. It just looked empty. For an entire island that's purportedly meant to have dragons everywhere, we only see a grand total of six poorly designed dragons, minus the ones captured by Opaline, and we learn virtually nothing about the location. And that's pretty much it. All right, on to the next one. G4 to G5 inconsistencies. So, ever since G5 came out, fans noticed a lot of inconsistencies with how much the world of Equestria has changed. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if G5 was its own thing, but because it is a direct sequel, the problems are much more apparent. Now, the technology aspect I never really had a problem with. As we theorized in my G4 to G5 timeline video, we figured out it's been anywhere from 70 to 150 years since Twilight's Rule, which is more than enough time for technology to excel to the point where cell phones, TV, and social media would exist. That's fine. What I'm referring to is things like, how are the sun and moon rotating on their own without Luna, Celestia, or Twilight? Was Twilight just really lazy and created a spell to make it automatic? And where are the changelings, Kirin, Hippogriffs, or any of the other creatures that inhabited the world? Why do dragons no longer need extreme levels of heat or a magic spell to hatch? Why do they have wings when they hatch? What about magic? And I'm not just talking about any specific spells, by the way. I'm just talking about all magic in general. Ponies no longer need to study to learn magic. Cutie marks no longer necessarily necessarily representing one's special talent or being earned through that talent. Also, the fact that cutie marks can now do anything from growing trees to amplifying freaking sound. The list of inconsistencies with G4 just goes on and on and on. And every time a new one is added to the list, it breaks the illusion of the story and suspension of disbelief, taking the viewer out of the story and destroying what little engagement they had. Lackluster Song Friendship is Magic had so many great memorable songs from Winter Wrap Up, Art of the Dress, In My Head Like a Catchy Song, Super Speedy Cider Squeezy 6000, Apples Forever, and so much more. And they ran the gamut from orchestral to country, rock, pop, polka, even rap. The new generation movie, for the most part, also had some pretty good songs. The weakest one probably being Looking Out For You, but otherwise they were upbeat, catchy, with my favorite being Fit Right In and the Angry Mob Song. And then we move on to Make Your Mark. The movie really set high expectations with a wide variety of music with different instruments, fun visuals, creative lyrics tying into the plot, and characters. Make Your Mark, meanwhile, gave us pop and pop and maybe hip hop? Ooh, hip hop. 
There were a couple of standout exceptions, however. Portrait Day, while way too short and only coming to a minute long at full length, was really good for what it was. Opaline's villain song, while not the most interesting lyrics-wise, at least had a unique sound to it and wasn't as generic as all the other songs in this show. There was also Sparky's Lullaby, which was almost a really good and sweet moment until it was ruined by butt speakers. You hear that song? A lot of the songs also have so little to do with the plot and the characters that I really think they came up with these songs first. They just found some way to fit them into the plot after the fact. I hear a lot of people also bring up the theme song as an example of a really good song coming out of G5, but I personally never really cared for it. I'm likely in the minority when I say this, but I thought it was just okay. Nothing special. Yeah, when it comes to Make Your Mark songs, other than the sisters' portrait song and the creativity song from Secrets of Starlight, I can't remember liking another single song. In fact, I can't even remember a single solitary lyric from any of the songs. 95% of the songs in this series are pop, and they all just blend in together. Let me put this as an exercise to you, the audience. Without looking it up, name me one song in Make Your Mark and give me the chorus line. If you can do that, you win the Cupid doll. That's it. On to the next point. Poor pacing, writing, and dialogue. Now, I will be fair. Friendship is Magic did have its fair share of weak or bad episodes with dialogue, character quirks, or story flow that feels rather forced or natural, leading to complete and utter disappointment. But for the most part, G4 managed to create interesting and unique stories, all the while having fun and clever moments that made this series so good. Make Your Mark scripts are an absolute train wreck. Every episode has moments of long, drawn-out dialogue that takes seemingly forever to accomplish a simple thing, or even tons of superfluous dialogue that just wastes the audience's time. There are many scenes I can pick out, but here are a few that really stood out. I don't like karaoke. It's the worst. Ugh. Do you <gasps> take that back? Karaoke is a fun activity for every age and skill level. Zip's allowed to like what she likes. Just because we enjoy something doesn't mean she has to. Error from clouds. <gasps> Special clouds. That's right. Uh, clouds. It's a traditional Pegasus gift. How fascinating. And clever. What kind of clouds? Nimbus? Cumulonimbus? Cirrus? Rain cloud? Who would do something like this? Her name is Opaline, and she is... Oh, Opaline! Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Cut you know, I was really racking my mind, like, who really would do something like this? Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. Continue. Izzy, who else did you think would do this? Honestly, uh, shut up. I've always been a little suspicious of Hitch's crab friend. Makes snips a lot. He's just so pinchy. I can't believe you don't shut up. If I could pick the single most forced line of dialogue from the show, it would have to be the exposition dump with Opaline explaining how she found Misty as a child, took her in, and how she owes her for the rest of her life. You've been gone so long, I thought you got lost. Like the time I rescued you as a filly. So kind of me to do that. Everybody got that? Also, I don't know if this counts as a pacing problem exactly, but it's something I noticed that really bothered me in Chapter 5. Missy grabs the magical key for the first time and gets whisked away to an unknown location. Then the episode ends off with a cliffhanger. Next episode, and it turns out she was just teleported to a nearby location in Bridalwood. No explanation, no follow-up, she was literally just whisked away for a cheap cliffhanger that does nothing more than waste the audience's time. This is the equivalent of ending an episode of a show where there's a mysterious knock on the door. Sophia then gets up to answer the door. Tense music builds up as she grabs the knob. And episode ends. Next episode, she opens the door and it's the Pizza Man bringing anchovies and broken dreams. Here's a different scenario with the Pizza Man example where the cliffhanger is done right. Sophia gets up, she turns the knob, opens the door, and sees her long lost father who she thought has been dead for 10 years standing there. Roll credits. That is an example of a cliffhanger that raises questions that will be answered and that the audience will be interested in getting answered. The key in Make Your Mark teleporting Misty, though, has no significance to the plot at all. It is just a lazy, cheap cliffhanger that is meant to get you to start watching the next episode and nothing more. All of this to say, the pacing be bad and me no likey. 
Again, G4 was ostensibly a show for children, but really did it feel like it was talking down to its audience. This allowed kids and adults to enjoy the various interactions, even relating to dilemmas that the characters were going through, creating this organic symbiosis between the characters and the audience. That level of brilliant writing is not found in Make Your Mark. Dialogue feels either overly simplified or dumbed down in some cases. G4 took risks and challenged kids to think differently with its various scenarios, whereas G5 just panders offering no mental stimulation whatsoever. The best episodes in the entirety of Make Your Mark would probably be Portrait of a Princess and Father of the Bridalwood. And even then, there are still dumb or drawn out moments that kill the pacing of the episode. And while I say those are the best episodes of Make Your Mark, they are only about as good as an average episode of Friendship is Magic. Let that sink in. Moving on. Plot Holes and Loose Plot Threads Alright, don't panic. We're not gonna sit here and list every single solitary plot hole in the series. Yes, this video would be a hundred hours long. No, we're just going to cover a few elements that really stood out that the writers forgot they established in earlier chapters. One of the most obvious being how Spike tells the story of how Opaline stole the dragon's fire magic and then became a fire alicorn, when in chapter four, they previous established that she was already a fire alicorn even at a young age. Remember that alicorn book that Misty found in the Zephyr Heights Royal Library and how she ripped out pages concerning Opaline? That never came back. I thought that would resurge in Chapter 5, and we would learn more backstory on Opaline or find potential weaknesses. But no, that whole thing with the book and the torn pages leads to nothing. Remember that compact mirror that Opaline was using to spy on Sunny? After the episode Alicon, Sunny never uses it again. Wouldn't she be the least bit curious at trying to contact her quote-unquote self again to see if she had any advice on the current situation? This could allow Opaline to not only keep an eye on things, but could further attempt to manipulate Sunny in more subtle in devious ways. But nope, forgotten. One of the most confusing plot holes slash loose plot thread that I've noticed has to be Twilight's plan and how Equestria was divided. So here's what we've been told so far. A unicorn hurt an earth pony one time, and that singular instance, which I guess has somehow never happened before in the history of Equestria, caused every pony to get upset over magic. Twilight then stored the magic in the crystals and the three tribes took the crystals with them to their homes. But we are also told that the reason Equestria fell is because Opaline attacked and was so powerful that Twilight had to store all magic in Equestria in the Unity Crystals, then sent the ponies away with them to go hide from Opaline. And it seems to be implied in the comics that the unicorn that hurt the Earth Pony one time was Opaline. But that doesn't make sense. Why was she just randomly assaulting an Earth Pony for no reason when she was supposed to be draining magic at this point? Also, what exactly is the story behind the stained glass window we see in Zephyr Heights? It's depicting the three tribes being given their crystals and they seem rather happy. Was the stained glass window also somehow made after the fall of Equestria? After the three pony kinds were divided? And to top all of this off, despite all the times the history of Equestria was brought up, despite Elderflower's tale alluding to Luster Dawn, despite Sunny's father literally spending his life exploring the history of Equestria, we still have practically Practically no clue as to what actually happened! As for the dragons, remember how it was mentioned that all the dragons had these cool and unique powers? That seemed like something that was going to play into the final battle. But nope, apparently the concept of Chekhov's gun does not exist in G5. Speaking of the dragons, something else that really pissed me off and that I somehow failed to include in my chapter 6 review was the fact that the dragons eventually became weak and sleepy due to Opaline draining the magic from the dragon stone. Despite the fact in the previous episode, it was established that it was Twilight's protection spell that caused the dragon slumber. Otherwise, Opaline could have just gotten the drop on the dragons, not only draining the stone's magic, but when they fall asleep, just drain the dragon's remaining magic. Gotta love it when it doesn't even take a season for the show to contradict itself. And finally, how about Misty's fillyhood? She was teleported away by that mysterious fog, again, something that was never explained, and Opaline just found her and cared for her. Okay, fine, and I can buy the fact that Opaline legit took care of Misty, at least initially, but how did the evil Alicorn not only manipulate her to her own evil plans, but made her forget about wanting to get back to her father? Misty would naturally want to leave at some point early on to get back home, and probably even asked Opaline to help her, but that never happened. Did Opaline essentially threaten her life? 
wife if she tried to leave? Lie and say her family is dead? Or manipulated her to say that staying with her is better for her? Or was it just that simple promise of, hey, I'll give you a cutie mark one day, Misty. Just stay with me. I don't know. But regardless of any scenario, there is no logical reason for her to willingly stay and work for Opaline as long as she did. Well, okay, if Opaline said that she would love to help Misty get back home, but tells the Philly that unfortunately the Twilight Invisibubble prevents her from doing this, and warns her that her home is far away with scary and dangerous creatures along the way, then I could kind of see that. And then sort of like Tangled, you would have a Mother Gothel-Rapunzel relationship going on. But even with something like that, Rapunzel was a baby when she was taken, and Misty was a kid, thus would at least question her home life with Opaline. <sighs> so yeah. That's about it, guys. There's all the reasons this colorful horse show failed. And to all of you out there who say that we shouldn't compare G5 to G4, it is a direct sequel and the only way to discuss many of the problems with G5 is by referencing G4. Plus, it's the one show that we know you've all watched, and we'll understand when we make some sort of reference to it explaining how to do something right in the show. I had such high hopes for this series after the movie gave us a fun introduction to the new generation, but unfortunately, that's just not the case. Make Your Mark is an uninspired, derivative, poorly written, absolute disappointment train wreck of a series. I kind of knew that G5 would never live up to the hype of G4, but I was hoping it would still be a fun, entertaining series, but for the most part, I'm just bored. If you guys like the series, that's fine. But for me, unlike Friendship is Magic, Make Your Mark is a show I will never watch again for fun. So now I ask you, the audience. With Make Your Mark concluded, what did you think about the series as a whole? Did you think it was a worthy successor to Friendship is Magic? Did it completely fail in your eyes? Or do you just have any other interesting observations about Make Your Mark in general? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to hit the subscribe button for both of our channels. Hey, good news! Looks like the teleporter is powered up and ready to go! Finally, I can get back home. I will say, this has been a rather interesting experience, but it'll be good to get out of this place. Well, I guess that about wraps things up. No stone left unturned. Are you ready? Fire away, Judge! Oh, wait a second! You guys didn't forget about Bob, did you? Bob? Who's Bob? Is he friendly and lively? Oh, yeah. Let's just say you're gonna have a blast with Bob. <laughs> I hate him. <laughs> <laughs>